Bye now, live. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to this meeting of the, the, uh, the Flood Resilience Partnership Board. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Could I, um, could I start off by checking for any substitutes nominated and any apologies? Uh, we haven't received any substitutes. Oh, sorry, that's no other screen going off. Um, we haven't received any substitutions, but apologies have been received from Mark Heath from the Canal and River Trust and also Toby Sang from Network Rail. Thanks, Kirsty. Not aware of any more. Um, okay, item two, if I can just remind members to declare any interests you may have, either now or on the appropriate items, probably. Uh, yes, uh, Jane. Sorry, Jane, you're, you're muted. Didn't work. Thank you. Um, uh, I am a member of the West Yorkshire Flooding um, uh, Regional Coast Flooding and Coastal Committee um, and obviously make decisions about the use of the levy and so on in relation to that. And I wanted to ask a, a general question really of, of advice about um, uh, interest because, of course, uh, we are looking today at the independent report on, on the events of February the 9th, and I was flooded on that day, and I just wanted to, um, it's not a pecuniary interest, but I just wanted to flag up a personal interest, and other members of the committee may have a similar experience. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, Councillor Patient, Scott? Similarly, I was just going to make a similar issue. I did escape flooding on this occasion, but was involved with the um, immediate aftermath of the flooding um, as a resident and as a flood warden within Mizen Lloyd. So yeah, just 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 to be clear in in terms of that and how that affects the discussion going forward. Thanks, Scott and Katie. Probably a similar point. Yeah, it's uh, same as me, uh, for uh, same as what Scott said, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think it's fine. I think it falls into those category of things that affect everybody living within an area and uh, it's it's right and appropriate for people to comment. Obviously, if you had a direct fiscal interest, that'd be a different matter. Okay, so um, minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of January, feels like a long time ago. Um, are we happy for those to be agreed as a, as a correct record? I need somebody else to move that as I wasn't there. So Jane, thank you for chairing that. And I think Jane and Scott both um, happy with uh, that. I'm certainly happy to propose uh, that, Chair. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Patient and Stephen. Are we all so all happy with that? Any um, any comments or, or factual points not covered elsewhere? I'm not aware of any. Um, so as we discussed at the start, apologies for those who'd come late, I agreed we'll take um, Granville's item, natural flood management, that's um, highlight report 7-2 first as, as, uh, as Granville has to leave. So um, over to you, Granville, if I may. Thanks very much, Chair, and, and uh, thanks for being flexible with the agenda. Really greatly appreciated. Apologies, yeah, as I say, I do have a another meeting to get to at three o'clock that I, I, I do need to be in. Um, I think, if, if I may, Chair, just before I go to the highlight report, um, perhaps just mention, I'm sure many members of the Partnership Board will know, and indeed members in the community, that um, a couple of weeks ago, Dongria Cond uh, sadly passed away after, after a long battle with cancer. Um, and I just thought it was just worth kind of mentioning her in a bit of a preamble to the NFM report. She was someone who was obviously... Um, very much engaged in kind of, I suppose, pioneering natural flood management in the upper Calder Valley, uh, found a member of Tree Responsibility and of the Source Partnership, you know, done an awful lot of work to promote tree planting and other forms of natural flood management across the upper valley and a very active member of the natural flood management operational group um, for the past sort of five years or so since I've been involved with that group. So I thought it was worth just kind of reflecting a little bit on the contribution that Dongri, I think, made personally, not just to the natural flood management um, kind of agenda within the valley, but also to kind of broader issues around, um, I guess, around sort of social justice and green issues and the environment more broadly. Um, so, yeah, I just really just wanted to kind of make mention her, remember her and 
and acknowledge the kind of contribution that she's made to a number of the communities across the Upper Valley. Um, if I just move on to, to the highlight report itself then, Chair, I mean, I'll be fairly brief. I won't go through every kind of item, but I think um, just to kind of update on where we are, we've been going through a programme of carrying out botanical surveys on a number of potential natural flood management sites um, to allow for kind of more rapid progression of schemes into the future and better understand what the environmental constraints might be with certain sites as we may develop them. Um, we've gone out for another round of the Landowner Grant Fund. We had a, a relatively small amount of money left over from the previous round. So that's round three, which has been targeted on the Upper Valley above Todmorden. Um, details can be found. I'm pretty sure they'll be on the website or certainly via the NFM um, at calderdale.gov uh, email address of that uh, grant scheme. And hopefully that will result in uh, further landowners coming forward to deliver NFM schemes on their land. Um, I think the other thing kind of just worth mentioning um, is we've got some further mapping work going on, looking at various scales of inter intervention um, across the valley and the Environment Agency have also just commissioned a piece of work to look at the overall scale of, of um, kind of NFM ambition, if you like, across the valley as a whole and what might be achievable, you know, almost, I suppose, in the utopian ideal world, if we got to a place where we could do NFM everywhere, what, what might that deliver? And then actually, where do we you know, see that it's practical to do it? Um, I think actually just coming back to Dongria for a moment, the other thing to mention is we, ha we have a, a new student bursary um, that's been funded at Leeds University um, in Dongria's uh, original name, if I can say that's of Penny. Um, and so uh, we've got now got the sort of first student working on that um, NFM bursary up at Leeds University. Um, in terms of progress, we're continuing to see progress with the previous rounds of NFM grants schemes. Um, more schemes are moving forward to completion. And I guess just in closing, maybe what I want to highlight is that we're reaching a point now with the NFM programme where we've largely spent all of the money or, or at least allocated, if not actually spent all of the money that has been provided to the program through booster funding and other routes over the past few years. So we do really need to be starting to open up that conversation with the partnership board about future funding of NFM. Um, we'd obviously hoped that the West Yorkshire Combined Authority Innovation Resilience Fund would be successful on that front. Unfortunately, it wasn't. But I think, nevertheless, kind of, you know, there's work done for that bid that hopefully we can use to um, unlock further funding for NFM as we go kind of through the next year or so. OK, thanks very much, Granville, and, and thank you for your words about Dongria, which I'm sure we would all endorse and, and would want to see um, recorded in this. Um, I've seen Scott indicated, but as this partly overlaps him, just before I bring him in, um, I appreciate that natural flood management is much wider than, than tree planting, but it's a part of it, and I'm aware that there's um, quite ambitious targets in the carbon reduction pathway that's being developed for tree planting. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering how we make sure the two things get properly, properly linked together. Um, I'll bring Scott in on that and then come back to you, Granville, because I suspect Scott, Scott may also have a, have a view on that. So, Scott. No, thank you, Leader. And I mean, I think it's interesting that this comes at a time when... Um, we have a cabinet report coming on Monday around the canopy cover for Calderdale as part of the White Rose Forest project and what we need to do. Um, it's obviously quite an ambitious target for Calderdale. It's, I think it's a third more, so up from somewhere around 12 to somewhere around 19 until 2050. So clearly there's quite a lot of planting to be done. Um, you know, I think when you look around Calderdale, it does seem like a lush and green and pleasant land, but um, I think an extra third will, will, will be... Uh, you know, substantial amount. I do sort of wonder um, what are the ways and means we're going to get there. I think in terms of context, we are in a new world where we've got a, you know, post-COVID and people are a bit more environmentally minded after the things that kept them going during that time. And also we do now have a Metro Mayor and clearly some of the things in the emission reduction path work, work that we did as well as what West Yorkshire Combined Authority do have some quite stringent ways of how we need to get there and it's not all about carbon sequestration obviously there's stuff about energy and transport but land use is a massive factor for us when we've done that gran granular work um, and I know you sort of referenced that the funding has come to an end and I think we I think we need to get on that now so I just wonder what 
I mean, obviously, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. It was a big loss that we left, that we didn't get that innovative flood money from the government. But I'd like to think there were more involved. So how does this, you know, like, what do we need to be saying collectively to our new mayor? And how does this sort of track going forward in terms of what we need to do to address some of that funding gap? And as a final thing, just to address um, your comments about Dongria, I would love to see us do something in her memory, um, if it's all possible. I don't know what that would look like. Um, I know the town council in Hebden Royd are considering naming a woodland or um, doing some sort of hedgerow project. Clearly, hedgerows are a, a, a massive need for us to start doing um, across the UK. So maybe that's something. Sorry to throw a lot at you there, but um, some more strategic questions and then just a smaller thing about um, Dongria's memory. Yeah, I mean, if I come to that, the last point first, if, if I may, um, Councillor Patient, thanks for that. What I should also have said is I'm aware that there are plans um, afoot for a, a memorial tree planting weekend, uh, kind of in, in memory of Dongria. Uh, I believe it's the last weekend in October. Um, so I'm sure there'll be further details of that to come in, in due course. Um, and I think, you know, the idea of kind of... Um, naming something after her is you know is a nice one I, I think that you know that may be something that we would explore perhaps with some of those within the community who, who really knew her very well as to what would be appropriate and what would be um the kind of thing that she would appreciate if she was still here let's put it like that I mean I think to the broader agenda I think you, you know you're absolutely right in terms of highlighting the link between kind of natural flood management opportunities land management um and, and tree planting amongst other things. Um, so certainly some of the intention of the, the mapping work that we're carrying out um, is kind of doing that in tandem with developing a more active kind of landowner engagement strategy and plan um, to hopefully identify those places where actually there is the opportunity for the further natural flood management, probably, you know, the opportunity also for the, for the scale of woodland planting that you've outlined there. Um, from a Yorkshire Water National Trust perspective, we are working on further plans to kind of build on our experience of building, of, of planting the new woodland up at Gorkley um, over the past few years um, with a kind of larger scale landscapes of water project, which would be across the kind of upper Colm, Holm and Colm valleys and across kind of both Yorkshire Water and um, National Trust estate. That will be very much, however, about kind of where it's tree planting and we've got some nature for climate funding to help with that. It's about kind of right tree, right place and, and recognising that probably a lot of the woodland creation opportunities will be kind of in cloughs and, and actually the habitat on the, on the moor tops and the moorlands has got other restoration um, activity and management activity that needs to be directed to it. Um, so I think, you know, that there are probably funding opportunities potentially coming the way of kind of natural flood management, nature-based solution type um, activity from all sorts of directions. There are a lot of people interested in, you know, kind of private finance and other sources of funding for, for offsetting carbon footprint and for contributing towards kind of biodiversity net gain. Um, I, what I have done and, and Neil and I have kind of done through the funding subgroup is asked um, Ben Fenton, the, the NFM officers, to start working up a bit of a paper on those kind of future funding opportunities so that we can understand that with, with a view to bringing that back to the board, probably in the autumn, if, if that fits the agenda. Thanks very much, Granville. Yeah, that, that's helpful. It'd be good to see that. Um, are there any other questions or comments for, for Granville on that item? Sarah, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, got my hand up here. Um, I just wanted to mention actually on the biodiversity net gain. Um, and I'm absolutely no expert on this and we're still very much finding our feet on what that's going to look like. But obviously the EA have set a target of 20%. And I think we need, there's merit in looking at that as at a programme level rather than on a scheme level. And just working out, um, again, using all the tools that the NFM group are doing to identify where is best places to do the interventions. Um, so colleagues in our um, environmental national team are, are working quite hard to to think about that as well. So that will hopefully bring in, dare I say, some funding looking at UGEN8, but also um, some opportunities as well to sort of hit targets across the valley, not just our own. And thanks very much, Joe. Any any more? Okay, thank you. So I'll I'll move us back now then to 
the agenda items in order, and that's um, the Mythen the Mythenroid flood alleviation scheme, reflections and learning. Um, so, paper circulated on this, but um, Jenny, I think, are you are you starting off the introduction to introduce these? Yes, thank you. thank you, Chair. Yeah. So, so this agenda item is split into two sections. Um, we have a run through of the key findings and conclusions of the independent report. And then I'll hand over to my colleague, Paul Swales, who take us through the lessons learned exercise that looks at the scheme delivery from the start to the completion of the scheme. So following the February 2020 flood event in Mythenroyd, uh, an independent consultant was commissioned to understand the event in more detail looking at the performance of the existing new and temporary flood defences during the event and what lessons can be learned from that. Part of the independent review was to model what happened during the flood event, what would have happened had the temporary defences performed as expected, and what would have happened had the scheme been complete. Um, what I would like to say is many thanks to members of the community and local authority that responded to our call for data. The photographs and video evidence that was recorded during the flood event um, was so helpful to help calibrate and refine the hydraulic model um, and you know to ensure that it accurately reflected uh, what happened on the ground and so as a result of that data we do have high confidence um, that the the model uh, reflects the events very well and very closely so the report identifies and confirms where and how the temporary defenses failed uh, these were in two key locations, opposite Burnley Road Academy and opposite Longfellow Court, concluding that these were deficient in their construction and installation. Now, in order to understand the impact of those failed temporary defences, the independent consultant looked at what flooding would have occurred had those defences operated as intended. Now, rainfall data and river level gauge data was collected from five gauging stations within the catchment upstream and downstream of Mythenroyd. Um, and the report concludes that the event that happened in February was of the scale of approximately one in 75 year events. And that's the second largest to occur in the Calder Valley since 2015, the 2015 event being the largest recorded in the valley. The river level rose um, approximately 4.2 metres over the course of 13 hours and exceeded the height of the existing pre-scheme defences in place. So as such, the river modelling undertaken demonstrates and concludes that the Mythenroyd flooding would have unfortunately still have occurred and the flood extent would have been to the same level and depth. What the report highlights is that the difference between what occurred in February and what would have occurred had the temporary defences performed as expected is the timing and the onset of that flooding. Um, and it concludes that some properties which flooded did so approximately two hours earlier than if the tem temporary defences had operated as intended. Um, and the, the final conclusion of the report, um, it looks at whether a completed scheme, what, what the flood outline would have been had the scheme been completed. And what it concludes is it most likely would have been contained within the new defences, although at the sort of the cusp of overtopping. So this evidence is with the with the scheme now complete, you know, there is a significant improvement in the level of protection now afforded to the community. So, so that, that is a very brief sort of run through of the key findings of the report. Um, and perhaps uh, now is an appropriate time to pause for any, any questions. Sorry, my turn to get it wrong. Um, yeah, Jane, Councillor Scullion. Thank you. And thank you, Jenny. And, and thank you to the Environment Agency for the commissioning of this report. It's really, really important that we do, we learn the lessons and we keep trying to, to go forward. Um, mm -hmm. I think what we learn here in the Calder Valley is actually of importance, not only regionally, but also nationally, in terms of how you live with climate change. And I often say in other meetings I go to that the Calder Valley understands climate change in an entirely visceral gut way uh, because we live with the consequences of our change, changing climate. Um, I have absolutely promised the chair that I will be entirely, entirely professional in my, my questioning and, and comments on this report. Um, but I wish in some ways that I could um, 
give people who haven't experienced a flood themselves the sheer fear um, that you feel in terms of the noise, the volume, the power of water. It's devastating power, really, to wreck mm. people's homes and livelihoods, really. And of course, we have to remember that Calderdale actually had its flood, you know, was it four weeks before the pandemic and the beginning of lockdown, the beginning of lockdown, there were people who were trying to get flood grants at the same time as they were self-isolating or had relatives who experienced COVID. It has been a fantastically tough time. Um, and I really do think we need to examine ourselves as a council and examine um, ourselves as partners, the Environment Agency, the Canals and Rivers Trust and Yorkshire Water with every single stage and sequence in terms of what happened to make absolutely sure that we don't put people through that stress and grief again if we possibly can. And in terms of questions, I have, I have a number of sort of wider thoughts and questions and maybe they should keep to a more strategic session um, in terms of thinking about reservoirs and future reservoir legislation and future capacity uh, in the system, for example. And I know there's consultation about reservoirs going on, le reservoir legislation going on at the moment uh, that's useful to feed into. Um, but I have two very, very specific points. And I think I and my fellow councillors would be letting the good people of my the Moid in particular down if I didn't raise them. And the first really is this question of the siren. Actually, um, it's laid out in a factual way within the report. Actually, people really depend on the siren. I and mean, by the time the siren sounds, I've usually got about three feet of water in my, my cellar. But a lot of people say, oh, it can't be that bad because the siren hasn't gone yet. Now, as the report makes very clear, the siren was silent um, on that event. And it has got, you know, not everybody goes online and looks at the river and water levels, the very useful um, telemetrics that we have. They really do depend on the siren. And there are people who have shops, who live on the tops, who come down to the shops during the day, those kind of things. People were waiting to hear the siren. And we know that not all flooding happens down the valley bottom, it happens halfway up, it happens because of surface water and all kinds of other things. People were waiting for that siren. And we, um, the council take the responsibility it has to take as well, but I really would like to have some more information about what, what happened in relation to the siren. And I think that is such an important thing. And I think we, we underestimate its importance for the future. We have to be better than that. The other, detailed thing I really want to just touch on in this meeting is to do with the undermining of the, the, the walls, the flood defences at the back of Hawksclough, um, at, at the back of White House, sorry, uh, going along towards Hawksclough. Um, that um, I'm not a flooding engineer, um, but uh, nonetheless, when you read the Arup report, it's fairly clear that um, uh, the wall would be washed away. As I said before, the sheer power of flooding to, to sweep, as we know, buildings and shops and other things in its path. In terms of the efforts that we made, uh, and indeed the army made, the council made, the people doing the modelling, the people on the ground made, um, what happened in terms of not actually thinking ahead about those things? So those are two things, Chair, that are really really exercising me and a lot of people in the valley in terms of the siren and the undermining at the back of White Houses. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jane. Um, Jenny, do you want to come back on that individually or should I bring uh, Councillor pa Patient in first? I'm happy to respond on that on those two comments. Yeah, I will draw my best. colleague, yeah. um, Paul, Paul Swells, into this as well. Um, so, so I'd, I'd like to respond to um, sort of the undermining of the defences. Um, there were uh, 
lessons learned, immediate lessons learned from the undermining that occurred um, with the breakup of the road, sort of, and then exacerbating a further kind of a pass through of water underneath. Um, and then the, the following week, uh, those were embedded and set in concrete. Um, and so that, that is a lesson learned that has been shared nationally um, throughout the framework. Um, and um, yeah, and so so just want to sort of just just touch on that in terms of those immediate lessons, um, and you know, and sort of feeding that back through to the supplier of the, the defences as well. Um, Paul, is there anything else that you would like to add with regards to um, the temporary defences? And could you please take the siren question? Thank you. Of course. Yeah, I, I was. Hopefully, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councillor Scullion, I wonder, did Jenny answer your question? Okay, because I. I, I you, you mentioned upstream of white houses, so I wasn't quite sure if we were talking about the same thing. So that was a, 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 a slip of the tongue. Um, I think it was in the report. I think it was the undermining of the, the defences. I think it was the wall at the back of, um, well, there were two places, weren't there? There was um, just opposite Longfellow Court, the gap there. And then there was the uh, bit at the back of white houses, wasn't there, I think. I no, I think no, I think the, the the metal where it came under the road, um, yeah. that was the metal cape, what we call the K barriers along Burnley Road. So that was downstream yes. of White Houses, up upstream of White Houses, and round the back of White Houses was sort of it was existing defences. Um, so it, we've got good evidence showing that where the scheme hadn't started there, it, it did overtop at around sort of eleven o'clock, half eleven in the morning. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. But if I come on to the siren question, though. Yeah, I I completely hear what you're saying, Councillor Scullion, about the the importance of the siren because I've, I've heard it from a, many community members in in or residents in Mythenwood, and the importance of it to them is is incredible, actually, um, even more so than the actual warning and alert that they receive. Um, but with, with regards to this particular event, um, the siren didn't sound um, and, and unfortunately it was missed by our incident room and, and human error can occur. So we, we issued the flood alert um, on Saturday evening, I think, and then the flood warning went out about five to nine on, on Sunday morning. And at that time, that's when the siren's supposed to sound as well. Um, but it didn't um, due to basically it was missed. And then when it was realised that it was missed, um, the power had gone on it. So it, it wasn't sounded, unfortunately. Um, but I'd like to reiterate, though, that I, I understand that the siren is incredibly important to the community, but it is our secondary system. I think it, I'm not aware of any other siren systems throughout the country. I, I could be wrong on that. Um, and, and Colerdale could be um, uh, on its own in that, that regard. But we have a primary system, which is the alert and warning system. And then we have that secondary backup system, which is the siren. Um, as we know, the Calder Valley is in an incredibly rapid responding catchment. And I'm aware that in, during this incident, in the, well, in the incident room, as it was then, um, that the flood warning duty officer at that time, there's only one person doing it, have so much to deal with, with the, with the um, issuing of warnings, alerts really quite rapidly. And, and, and their, prior, their priority is to get those alerts and warnings out. And, and if, this, if the siren is sounded as well, fantastic. Um, but in terms of lessons learned, what we've done since then is actually um, increased our number of people on flood duty so we have we have a team of duty officers on 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year and within that team now we've got an additional flood warning duty officer for exactly this sort of situation where you've got lots of different things happening you've got phone calls coming in you've got alerts to issue warnings to issue sirens to issue so we've added that um, extra resilience into our standby or duty teams so I think that's something that's that um, will will uh, reduce the impact of it happening again. But I guess we can never take away that human factor. Um, sometimes things are missed, um, but in this case, 
the warning and the alert were sounded. I think there probably is a wider conversation to be had around the sirens. Um, and, and we can take that offline, I guess. Thank you. Joe, do you want to come in on the same point? Yes, I was. Thanks, Paul. Just to reiterate, I am a, one of those good warning duty officers that sit in that incident room and are responsible for issuing those warnings um, and flood alerts. And in a, in a big incident, um, the way that things, the way it works at the moment is the flood warnings are sent from one system, the siren is sounded from a different system, so it's not automated. So I know our incident team are looking at to see whether actually as soon as that warning goes out, it triggers a siren as well. Um, because it, as I say, really, really busy. Um, and yeah, we've just got to get the warnings out as our priority. Um, but we appreciate that the siren is, is a key way of warning the, the communities in Calderdale. So we are looking at seeing whether they could be sort of merged almost to try and eradicate that, that human error. Um, and Paul, um, just on your point about other sirens, there are, is one in White Beck in Leeds. And that's the only one I know in the country outside Calderdale. So and it doesn't get sounded as often as the ones in Calder Day also. <laughs> yeah, just, just to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Jane, do you want to come back on that? Yeah. I'm I'm really pleased, really pleased to hear that. And I can't tell you how how sorry I am really that that, that didn't happen. Really. I'm, you know, I'm I'm sorry on behalf of the council and that I think it's it's a sign of a a mature organisation that's trying to trying to get better that you do admit mistakes and you do apologise to people for the for the terrible experiences they've had. I found this report really very very hard reading, actually um, really hard reading because it did it did bring what was a, a tremendously um, powerful and difficult event uh, for us as residents and for us as ward councillors. Uh, back to me. I just wanted to come back, Chair, if I may, on the, the question of that communication with the public and the importance of the siren. But of course, there's also the telemetry and the um, river river levels um, online, which we also use in terms of Ion Calderdale. Now, in the last year, last five years, actually, Things have been set slightly lower in terms of sensitivity and wide and wide while the works have been go going on, and I think that's the right thing to do. But I'm afraid there is a degree of confusion sometimes in terms of, you know, is that a flood warning or is that a flood alert and which is worse than the other? And it's something that we've talked about in other uh, settings in terms of being clearer about the language in terms of you know, when do you just look out the window and see how hard it's raining and what the river is looking like? And when do you actually start moving your stuff upstairs? Um, and I think the other thing is, there is a beginning to be a bit of a degree of cynicism about the telephone warnings and the telemetry, because we have had a few experiences recently uh, where um, the, the online predictions have shown ridiculously high levels and, and people are looking out at the river and it's, it's, it's fantastically low in the riverbed. So I do think we need to think going forward in somewhere that's as um, flood sensitive as the Calder Valley in terms of just getting that right in terms of going forward now that the, the fences are in at least some of the, the upper Calder Valley in terms of the telemetry the warnings and then the language really because I think we all have a responsibility to get that right. Thanks Jane. Um, do can come, I come, sorry yes. Joe, do you want to come back? Or? Yeah, do you want me to respond to that? Um, so yes, um, it is, I think as we're all aware on this on this call, it is incredibly difficult to forecast within the valley, within Calder Valley, probably more so than anywhere else, certainly in, in Yorkshire, which is the area that we deal with. Um, and that is why our contact and relationship with the likes of Scott and Katie is so important during these, these incidents. And, you know, we're sat in a nice dry incident room in Leeds, absolutely. And we're looking at all these fancy systems, but actually knowing what is going on in the ground is really, really, really important and, apps and does help with our decision-making. And where we have the time, and we will speak to, all, to the wardens in the different areas to say, what do you think, um, you know, and make a decision based on, on their, their information as well. Um, 
So yeah, we do try, we do try, like I say, and have that on the ground evidence and information coming into us as well. So yeah. And I know myself when I'm not on duty, I sort of busman's holiday, I'd always keep an eye on the, the river levels in Calderdale and sometimes panic myself when I see them going straight up, you know. Um, and it is something that is constantly being evolved. It's a beta service. So any feedback you have and what we have online, please, please do do feedback to our national teams. I know at Calderdale, there's an awful lot of things that are trialed because of unfortunately the, the amount of flooding that, that is that is suffered in the valley. So Thank you, Joe. Um, Scott, I think you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, like Councillor Scullion before me reading this was found quite difficult and emotional um, to peer through. Um, it really brought back quite a lot of the complexities and just really the memories of sort of that morning. Um, for those unaware, I live yards away from where one of the breaches happened. Um, as a brief aside before I carry on, I do think, and this isn't for now, uh, but I'm quite interested in the um, cell phone takeover work that's being trialled sort of across the UK. And I, I believe that that could potentially be a bit of a game changer in terms of flood warnings. Um, having been in, 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 in America and having that happen to me in the supermarket, I can attest to how powerful it is to every single phone all around you beeping as louder than you've ever heard you know they use it often for um, missing persons in america but often for you know tornadoes and stuff in various places i'd like to I think it'd be good to for you guys to come back here at some point and let us know more about where you guys are at with that kind of project because i think for calderdale in particular that could be that could be really interesting um so i mean in terms of that day i really want to focus on the sort of the two hour gap um, part of the report because I think those two hours um, would have been a real game changer for some people. Um, I think at the time, just casting my mind back to waking up and seeing the water starting to pour um, out of the gap opposite Longfellow Court and joining and trying to push things back and bailing water back in and realise realising it was futile quite quickly um, to seconds later having to put piggyback people out of Sainsbury's across the you know what what was basically Burnley Road which had now become a river to then having to go to my children's school which had you know was flooding for the second time and already seeing pieces of work floating along the ground and um and then round the corner to the guy's house who was smashing through his front window because he'd tried in vain to get things up above and realised he had to abandon his family from there. So I, I think we've always had a really good collaborative relationship with the Environment Agency as ward councillors and as Calderdale. And I don't, don't deny that, but it would be remiss of me to my constituents and the people around to say, what would you say to those people that were frightened at that point that if they'd have had a few extra hours could have really made use of that time? Whose kind of fault do you think that was? Was that your fault? Was that the contractor's fault? And if there's an answer to that, how's that going to tighten up your systems in working with contractors going forward? Um, I think I think those are valid questions that need answering. The, the scheme is complete now. And I think it's made neither more look and feel a lot better. It's given it a sense of place. You've managed to do some retrospective town planning that I think vastly needed doing. You know, we've got wide open vistas now and new energy and new businesses and new people moving into the place. So there's no, there's no doubt that people feel safer, that people have a sense of place. But I do think those two points need missing because people do have short memories, but I think the people that have, Moved, uh, decided to move away because that was the final straw. Yeah. We'll always remember it. And I think those that are still potentially living with climate change and what it's doing are always going to remember it. So I think it's important for you, you guys to address those two points if at all possible. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Jenny? Yes, thank you. I think it's, it's first really important for me to say that those the deficiencies in those defences are absolutely below the standard that we would um, aim to work for and at, you know, and, and we apologise for that. Um, and 
you know, absolutely recognise the, you know, the distress that that will have caused. Um, there have, there has been, um, when I talked about lessons learned earlier, we've also looked at our sort of shoe code of practice, um, which is our safety, health, well-being and environmental documents, which covers all of our sort of construction projects across across the uh, across the UK, um, and it's a it's a code of practice uh, which we have specifically looked at the temporary works section of that guidance document uh, and made some revisions to that um, off the back of of what we have learnt, you know, within Mythenroid and and within the other schemes as well. But there has been a policy sort of shift in that code of practice as a result of that councillor Scott. Um, just briefly think, to yeah. follow up on that, and Robin may want to add, on, add, add to this, but I, 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 there was a meeting shortly after that that um, I think we'll I think we'll all remember your your um, Jenny, your not predecessor. I know who your Aidan was uh, another one in the firing line on that meeting, and it was a very emotionally fraught meeting mm -hmm. above a pub. I don't know whose idea it was to put it above a pub, but it was a very, very bad idea um, because I think it only fueled the emotion that was already happening. Mm -hmm. um, so it's worth reflecting on what that meant, not just for the people, but also for your guys organisationally, that all the partners around and how they had to respond to people that were quite frankly angry. There were people there that had heard about it on the news that came to express their frustration and emotion. Um, it was a mixed bag in terms of what people were saying, but... I, I would like to just, um, while you're tightening up your processes and how you work with constructors and uh, health, um, health and well-being of people that are affected by schemes like this, it's also worth thinking about the likes of yourselves who are being put in the firing line and have to answer these kinds of questions. Um, it was a very, very difficult time for everyone. Mm. Um, and I think no one really needed to kind of go through that. Um, so I'll just leave it there, really. But, um, I mean, thank you for answering the question so frankly um, and appreciate the apology um, I think that's really helpful um, and yeah thank you thank you chair may I just very briefly respond on yeah, that no, um, and and I would just just like to thank you councillor Scott for also considering the well-being of the staff as well um, and I think it is um, a really fine balance between you know being visible and present um, when you know things such as this as happen um, and, it, and it is important to the staff and the project team that, that we are there with the community in it um, but yeah we do I do thank you um, for for noting that that also comes with a with a deal of, of pressure and stress as well so so thank you for that consideration thank you um, Robin Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, uh, it's up there in my, um, I've had one other meeting in my career like that, I think, uh, when we were looking to, um, well, it was looking to be a drug rehabilitation unit into a residential area where there was a level of, um, of angst and anger in, in a meeting. Uh, myself and Adrian were sort of at the heart of that. And it was entirely understandable, um, not just around this issue, but the level of distress so soon after so many other events and and the one in a 75 year event five years after a one in a 125 year event i mean you don't have to be a mathematician to say that we're living in a climate emergency do you because that shouldn't be the way it works so i think absolutely recognize that and i do appreciate the honesty and the clarity that this report gives in general and i, I welcome it and i know ea worked really well with us and it's an ea and, and council partnership in every step of this journey we recognize that and there are things the council could have done better and there's always learning i do think a couple of points and the warning and informing one positive the sort of notification that council patient was referring to there is a significant piece of work that's been done by west Yorkshire resilience forum about introducing that model around all sorts of critical incidents uh, and that's quite well advanced and that will include potentially a counter-terrorism incident a severe weather incident etc so there is good progress being made on that. And I think we should maybe report that back at a future meeting. Uh, but warning and informing is so difficult. How do you deal with the fact that people tire of uh, uh, a siren that goes off and then uh, there isn't a flood event? Um, I've been, you know, there's the, the, I remember in, being in Hebden Bridge uh, the summer before on a Saturday afternoon when the siren went off and there was just the air of, of quiet anxiety, but efficient action 
was something that really does leave a legacy with you if you if if you're not sort of local or you don't experience it. And I hear the siren go, although I'm higher up, but I hear the siren go from Walsden, and you know that that moment is has an impact for all of us. So how do you balance that? I think I think we just have to recognise we're not always going to get that right, but it's better potentially to warn people and it not lead to an event than we have a situation where we are dealing with a flood and people haven't known. So that balance of being prepared to say that. The other thing I just, uh, maybe Jenny, just a couple of, a very specific, a very specific paragraph, 7.17, 7, um, just to pick up the point, and I think this is something about living with, living with risk and flooding, that it says the flood event was greater than the design standard of protection that the, 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 the mass MAFS the defences provide for. However, it's our view the river flows would have been contained within the new defences had the scheme completed, given allowances in terms of uncertainties. I think I think the point from that paragraph is we still live and will always live with uncertainty, and we cannot be sure. Absolutely, I I I, I take from that 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 it would have um, entirely protected the town, um, but we 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 would hope it would. And I suppose the point for us as public agencies is how we mitigate risk, but we can't entirely eliminate it. And I know, and I've discussed it with uh, James Bevan that that there is a way in which living with risk is part of our lives in the Calder Valley, but we will seek to do all we can to mitigate it. And I guess the other thing is the learning from this, being assured for the council as well as EA that we do take the learning and act on the learning in the next programme, in the next phase, and that we need to make sure through this board that we're sense checking that and we're accountable to do that. But I do think I recognise that we cannot entirely eliminate risk in Calder Valley. Thanks very much, Robin. I think that's a great summing up of where we are. Is there any any other comments on that? So just reiterate thanks to the Avara Agency for carrying this work out and bringing bringing the report here. I think it's really important that we've that we've done that. So thank you. Oh, people, okay if I move on? Chair, could um, I just of, hands, please, Chair? Sorry, uh, oh, have I? Oh, Paul, right? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, yes. sorry, Katie was Katie was first, I think. Chair, sorry, I think. Okay, so let, let me go to Katie first and then to you, Paul. Yeah. Sorry, I just put my hand down. I was considering whether I was gonna say something because lots of the points have um, already been covered, but it does and thank you for the report. I did um, read it over last weekend and discussed it with Joe and uh, Scott this week as, as to how the community would um, deal with the report and 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 understand it. And I think uh, largely, I think a lot of people haven't read it yet, it hasn't um, been widely um, shared. So we haven't really seen the, any repercussions from that. And certainly not any questions have come um, my way at, the, at this stage. Um, but it, it, the two hour thing obviously is, is, is already been brought up and it is really important. And it would have um, bought people a lot of, of time two hours as, as, it, as it shows on the report. And it was just unfortunate that um the timing of it that people were still sleeping it was a weekend and you know having that two hours would have would on that occasion would have was really really important but it just highlights that the community used so many different methods to get their information and you know if one person solely uses the siren then that, that that's their way of, of getting that information and they probably know how long it takes to to gather their stuff and, and get into a position of, of safety, um, but we but we have to be really careful that we have we've got a lot of new people in the village and how we communicate all those different methods to them. And actually, you know, my preference is that everybody signs up for everything and be absolutely prepared. But that what that brings is then complacency when you get all the alerts. I'm signed up to everything as a flood warden and as a resident in the flooded area. But we do have a huge level of complacency and we also have an issue that people think the Mind and Mind Defences are the answer to flooding in their house and business. And that is a really, really important thing that we need to address. Um, but yeah, that's one for future future talking to. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Paul, you'd already indicated, so I'll come to you. 
thanks, Chair. Yeah, just one one point that I'd like to just em emphasise on the on the call really is around a uh, comment that Councillor Patient made around and what Katie just just mentioned around that two hour gap. That if 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 the community do or residents do feel that that may have um, caused them some sort of loss, financial loss that. I think we we made it clear in the in the summary document that they can contact ourselves, and there is a potential claim. I'm not going to say that there are any claims definitely available, but we will look at those. Um, so yeah, just wanted to reiterate that point. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Okay. Any anything else to add, um, Scott? You want to come back on that? Yeah, I just want to be really brief um, before. Thank you. And um, as others have said, I didn't say it before, but thank you for the report. It's really thorough. Um, I think it goes through a lot. And I think whether you were there or not, you can definitely get a sense of the timeline of the of events. And as you said, um, certainly what was shared on the day and the days following and weeks following was lots and lots of footage. I think now we live in an era where people are pulling out their phones. That's obviously helpful for you putting together a timeline of events. Just to come back on Paul a little bit in terms of the um, in terms of the um, two hour thing, and I think it's actually less about financial restitution and more about the emotional impact of what happened and and how quickly. Um, I know that's not addressable with compensation, and it's been. I know Jenny mentioned it before in terms of well-being and, you know, forward plans of how you do things. So I was meaning more in those sense. And I know you've been really good um, with people throughout the, sorry about that, throughout the time of the scheme in terms of um, compensation for um, loss of gardens or for um, the kind of work that you've done. But that was more my broader point. But just to round up, um, thank you for it. Um, hopefully it will play a part in the Section 19 report, which are eagerly look forward to seeing as well and um, welcome Jenny thank you okay thank you um, right I'm not seeing anybody else so thank you and we'll receive and note those reports and the various actions so if I could move us on then to um, item six flood risk reduction and investment group um, Jenny I think is this you again was it Paul Oh, we've got another it's Paul actually chair oh, and I think apologies. We've, we've got a little bit before that as well just sorry about yeah about the um reflection learning lessons learned on the overall project as a whole so I was going to run briefly through that apologies and, yeah yeah so so we've been undertaking quite a uh, ex behind the scenes an extensive um lessons learned process or sharing experiences because we wanted to capture um, all the lessons that we think we've learnt throughout the project and share that experience wider with the with um, internal and external colleagues. Um, <clears throat> and unsurprisingly, I don't know it's because people have already read the what I've put, but Scott has already stole some of my thunder as he as he usually does. Um, but I thought I'd outline some of the, the process that we've gone through first. And then just real whistle stop tour of what, what I found to be some of the key learning, learning items. We will publish this report. Um, we'll, I, I would hope it would be ready by the next time we meet, because um, it is it, we, we have drafted it, but it does still need a little bit of work. But what we've done so far is we, we started off with a, an internal project workshop um, between the current and the past team, as well past team members, because we've had quite a lot of changeover during the project and then we had four separate workshops with our delivery partner VBA so Volkers and Atkins um, and we focused on four different themes design and technical um, contract and commercial sites and site operations and management and then finally my favorite comms and engagement um, but we also I chaired a open discussion with the Mide and Lloyd FAS key stakeholder group to really focus in on the comms and engagement side and, and how, how they felt that had gone. And then also gathered feedback from uh, external partners, in particular Colderdale Council, and then gathering feedback from other EA internal teams. So you can see there's been a, a lot of work under, undertaken um, and a lot of partners involved. 
Um, I just want to touch on some of the general themes of, of what we think has gone well throughout the project, because of quite a lot of them uh, cross over into the, into the four themes that I've just previously mentioned, and then some of the things that didn't go so well. Um, for me, this project has been, and I think on behalf of the project team, it's been an, an incredible achievement to be sitting here now with the construction fully complete five years later from the Boxing Day floods, or well, it's five and a half years now, but um, but from a standing start, it, it really is a phenomenal pace that this project has been delivered. Um, I think we've made some excellent relationships on the ground um, with community members, partners, particularly uh, local councillors. And I think also what's gone well is what, clearly the project has had a number of significant challenges um, to name but a few, the water main burst, um, coronavirus pandemic, the significant flooding we had last February, and also the potential closure of Burnley Road. But we've overcome all those, and, and we are where we are today um, with a completed project. Um, but what didn't go so well, and we've sort of touched on some of these in some of the previous comments, um, particularly the well-being of, of staff, which was mentioned, um, due to the pace of the project, certainly early on, um, some of the staff, some of the project team were really under a lot of stress and strain, and it probably wasn't recognised at the time. Um, also, the team consistency, which I've just mentioned about um, having some of the past team members um, for many different reasons, but one being well-being, the, the project team has changed over time, um, but others for other reasons that they've left the organization or whatever. But that was one of the key things that the community mentioned to me, um, um, having a consistent project team. Um, and then as I guess linked to the, the timescales of the project and the pace it's being delivered, that we had to work out of hours more, more than probably what we should have or what we wanted to, but that was to deliver that or adhere to the government commitment to deliver that pro program at pace. Um, so they're sort of a, a snippet of some of the things throughout the project. If I go into a little bit more detail of or highlight a couple of points on each of the themes, so just touching on the design and technical, um, just the first bullet point about, again, delivered at pace, but the design was, was, was undertaken in one, point, one and a half years compared to what would normally take four years. Uh, and that was in part due to the, the excellent collaborative working between our designers, Atkins, and, and our contractor, Volkers, working side by side, essentially. But as previously mentioned, the well-being on the, on the team and the pressure on the team was in very, the pressure was incredibly, incredibly stressful. So looking back, maybe we, 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 we undertook some, something called stop and take stock sessions early on since my involvement in the project, two and a half years, we haven't had one. So it's something that we probably need to do a little bit more of throughout the project process. Just moving on to contract and commercial, um, something that the team thought went really well was identifying and keep maintaining um, the risk workshops, but maybe that group grew too big at times and there were too many voices, but keeping that a little more niche would be, would be a great improvement. Um, and I think one that we've all we can all uh, adhere to or agree with is that working virtually actually works can work really well. Um, so the team felt that once the coronavirus pandemic started and a lot of people were off site and working from home, that the project could continue behind well on site, but also behind the scenes as well. Um, Moving on to site operations and management, I've just mentioned there about the working off site, but actually working on site, that's something that Volkers did incredibly well was their, their alterations to working practices around COVID. Um, so they introduced different measures, simple things, sort of staggering start times for the operatives, staggering lunch breaks, but also including these, the two metre social distancing beepers. So if they got near to someone, this beeper would go off. Um, and then twice weekly lateral flow tests. All these little little things were really were, were excellent. And as far as I'm aware, that they didn't have one uh, positive um, 
coronavirus case on site from working on site, which is a real credit to them. And then another one which I wanted to pick up was about the Health and Safety Steering Group, which Coldale Council were, were part of. Um, really good walking around the site, identifying issues, rectifying issues, but something that could be improved was having those from the very start of the project or even before we're on site, because they didn't start until a little bit into the, into the construction programme. And then finally, uh, just my favourite, because it's the bit that I've been involved with most, is around comms and engagement. Um, a, a big point for me, and I think the community highlighted, was when, when we had the Flood Information Centre in the Mythenroyd Community Centre car park. We, we should have kept that for throughout the project, um, because when it moved up to the compound, it didn't, didn't, didn't get as much footfall. Um, so I think that's definitely one for the Hebden Bridge team to take on board when they when they move into there and, and get that community hub um, right in the heart of the village so the community can come and ask any questions that they have. Um, and then another one for me was around becoming an integral part um, of, of the existing community meetings, so like Royd Regen, um, the London Foot Ward Forum, becoming a, a standing item on the agenda. Um, really embedding ourselves into that and answer any questions and and give the, the community updates. So I think that that worked really well and one one that future projects should take. So overall, just to conclude, incredibly challenging project delivered in in a very quick time. I um, mean, it's one that the team are very proud of. Um, I mentioned some of the key issues around continuity of staff. Um, I didn't mention it, but having clear audit trails of decisions as well, um, which is really important. Um, and building relationships with the community, key partners is, is, is fundamental to any project. Um, but the well-being of staff needs to be considered, be considered as well, um, or have even more consideration. Um, and like I said, I would hope that this report is 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 finalized by the time we meet next so that was just a flavor well thank you very much paul and apologies for um <laughs> for trying to skip over that item uh scott yes thank you chair um yeah i'll just be brief um it's a really good report thank you paul and um i think i think clearly um for those unaware uh, it's not usual for you guys to do a scheme in such a visible location. You're normally tucked away at the end in coastal areas, aren't you? Or in embankments or down away from prying eyes. And I think the visibility of this scheme was really challenging right from the start. Um, everyone had a thought about what you were doing. Everyone had a thought about the disruption they were facing. And clearly disruption was always going to be a part of the scheme in its totality. I think in terms of your comms and engagement, that got a lot better as the scheme progressed. It wasn't there at the start. I don't think it was as strong initially. Um, and I know you, Paul, without giving you too big a head, was were you know were um, welcomed by the community in terms of your tone and how you communicated with people and your engagement at some of those meetings, um, as well as the ones that were less formally about um, about such a thing. I think the six monthly um, big sort of I forget what you called them, the engagement sessions that you ran at the community centre were really, really helpful for people to just drop in um, and come and speak to you guys, really get into the nitty gritty and the detail about what had come and then the design and what was coming forward. So, yeah, thank you for all of that. And um, I think if you can repeat that from the start in Hebden Bridge, which... Which, is, which will be equally challenging, I would say, um, working into my crystal ball in terms of um, interested parties um, and a community very much interested in the minutiae of everything that's going on. I think you'll crack it. Um, good to hear some of the detail about the audit trail and health and safety. Um, but um, thank you on behalf of my Royd for the scheme coming to an end. It does look fantastic. Um, we do feel safer. I am still slightly smarting for not getting the correct wall finish that I wanted, but I guess that's democracy for you. Um, you put that to the vote. Um, but no, thank you for everything and thank you for this report. Thanks very much, Scott. Any any other questions or comments for Paul? Paul, anything? Uh, Jenny? Yeah. 
<laughs> just really briefly, um, just it, you know, doing this lessons learned exercise was was really an important part um, of sort of the project coming to an end um, to make sure that we. Uh, you know, we carry those lessons into the following projects, as, as Councillor Scott has referred to. Um, and, and also what we're really trying to do is also to retain uh, that continuity of staff as well. Um, so that that sort of that knowledge of the area and patch um, is, is carried through into the projects. Thank you. Thanks very, thanks very much, Jenny. Um, Paul, anything else you wanted to come back on? No, nope, don't think so. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you again very much. And thank you. So again, good piece of work. Um, so I'll try again. <laughs> uh, flood, flood risk reduction and investment group. Um, yeah, is this you, Paul? Start? It is me again. Yeah, sorry, I've got my voice again for a few more minutes. Um, start off with, well, I'll touch very briefly on my um, Construction is complete. Um, Volkers have, have demobilised from site. Um, the communal garden at Calder Grove, the community centre car park have all been handed back now to, to, the, to the appropriate owners. Um, and we're currently undertaking site walkovers actually within the project team um, to look for basically snagging issues, we call them. Um, anything that we need rectifying before, um, before we can officially or get the the, the, the scheme handed over to ourselves um, because I think I might have mentioned it in the report, but there, there is a Volkers as the delivery partner have a, once that the scheme is handed over to ourselves, we have a two year defect period. So if any, any issues that do occur um, within that period, they're, they're contractually bound to rectify those. Um, there is a few things that still need to be done um, on the scheme, but there's basically there's a handful of flood doors still to be fitted um, um, but but they are literally a handful. So and, and we do have those doors now. I think we did have problems with, due to the coronavirus pandemic um, getting them from Germany. Um, but I think we've got them. So we're just arranging for with the residents to get those doors fitted. And we're still working with the Department for Education as well to get that added resilience at Burnley Road Academy. I think we're still just waiting for the funding to be signed off. Um, but we're, we're still DFE are very confident that we'll be able to get that money and, and undertake that work. Just moving on now to Hebden Bridge briefly. Um, there's been a £4 million uh, ESIF bid approved in principle to contribute towards the scheme. Um, they undertook a successful siren test um, at the end of May because the siren's been moved. Um, and in that same vicinity, uh, they're undertaking the wall repair to the adult learning centre um, and looking to deliver the canal overflow works this financial year as well. And then just finally on Hebden Bridge, we're undertaking a bit of a cost review at the moment to obtain the accurate cost, accurate cost for the project moving forward. Um, touching on Errington Hillside and Stubbing Home Road, quite similar progress really that detailed design is ongoing um, uh, and, and feeding into that detailed design is, is around sort of the ground penetrating radar surveys, ground investigation, and all, all that information can be utilised to, to um, progress uh, detailed design and progress the full business case, particularly around for Stubbing Home Road. Park Road, Elland, um, I think the modelling uh, calibration that was undertaken following the February event sort of just reinforced our knowledge of the, the flooding issue there. Um, so it's not just river and then river into the canal and canal flooding it. And but there's also the surface water element. So I understand discussions are still ongoing between key partners to progress this scheme. Um, Copley Village had undertaken an economics review on that one um, to look at the wide, well, basically the, a wider project for Copley Village. So that's looking at um, the, basically the whole embankment surrounding the village um, and, and trying to better protect them. I think there's about 170 properties at risk. Um, Hebblebrook is progressing very well. Um, outline business case has been submitted um, for project assurance, and we're hopeful to start construction early 2022, so not, not in the too distant future, and detailed design is continuing on that or commencing on that one shortly. Um, Walsden, Strategic outline case has been submitted for approval. 
and that'll be looking at reviewing the long list of options to better protect Walsden and Network Rail of one of our key partners in, in that project because we'll hope to reduce risk to the, the, uh, the railway line as well. Um, Sorby Bridge, again, developing a strategic outline case for that project. And then some good news for Brighouse Flood Alleviation Scheme that the outline business case for that has been recommended for approval by our internal assurers. I think it's our large project group, excuse me, our large project review group. And, and once that's signed off internally, details, detailed design can commence on the preferred option for Brighouse. Um, and I think that is a real whistle stop tour on the on the, the project updates. If anyone's got any questions, I'm sure myself, Jenny or Joe can answer them. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, Jane, you've got a question. Um, great, great to have all this going on and it's exactly what we need. Um, and we just need to keep moving forward at pace. I just want you to ask a question about the funding of the Walston um, scheme, the future funding, and clearly this is very important to Network Rail. This is absolutely key and often the railway line in Walston um, is, is going down quite early in, in a severe weather event and clearly that's got an economic um, disbenefit to Calderdale and indeed beyond because of the importance of that railway line to us. Are we in negotiation with uh, Network Rail about um, um, part funding this scheme? Um, I'll take that that one, um, Councillor Scullion. So um, I don't know whether Rick's still on the call or not, but Network Rail have part funded the modelling already. So uh, they've already contributed to the first stage of the project and we have regular project updates with, um, with them. And yeah, once we know what the design and what the cost is going to be looking at, um, we'll be working with Network Rail to secure further funding for it. So yeah, they are very much committed to the, this scheme. Um, yes, Councillor, I'd just like to add up to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, we're very much working in a symbiotic re relationship with us for the benefit of everybody, really. Okay, thank you. Any other any other questions on that? Um, yeah, that's quite, quite significant, as Robert says in the chat. Okay, thank you. If I, if I could move us on, just to say that we... We seem to have lost um, most a, a number of people, and I think in terms of elected members, Jane and I are the quorum. So um, <laughs> I hope, hope we're both okay for the rest of the meeting. But uh, yeah, um, so we're on to the highlight reports from the operational groups. And um, can I come to you, Katie? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just um, some quick ones from me. Um, from the last meeting in April, we just had updates on um, household and business grants, which um, seems to be ticking along really nicely. And, and the process is, is a lot smoother, as we discussed in the, in the last meeting. Um, and there was, for residential, there were 315 applications. These um, figures are from April and I will be gathering um, more up-to-date figures for the next meeting um, in a couple of weeks. Um, so the 315 household um, grants, um, 208 of those hadn't received grants before, which was, was great, um, obviously, because we know the constraints around um, getting a second grant at this stage. Um, and yes, some of those are actually being carried out now, and the same um, for businesses. Um, it would appear that the business process was a lot smoother the, when they applied for a grant. Um, pretty much all the hard work was taken away. It was, they were, Region Partners were the contractor for that and they dealt with the surveys and, and the work, um, so, which was a lot better process than we'd seen in previous years. Um, and I look forward to hearing um, some feedback on that in my next meeting just to see how that's gone with the business uh, community. Um, we had an update from Healthy Minds to say unfortunately their funding um, was coming to an end and um, that we funded, part funded through the um, partnership board which was uh, disappointing to hear and they haven't been able to gather further funding um, as I believe there's some internal conversations going on as to whether we can have that as a resource 
um, uh, to continue that result in Colesdale rather, because um, it continues in Tottenham at the moment. But our portion of that was for the Upper Valley and was very well received. And um, Johnny explained from Healthy Mind in the last meeting that it was um, extremely disappointing for some of those residents for that resource to come to an end. So I'm hoping that we'll have some updates from that in my uh, next meeting um, on that resource. Flood wardens have been still very active. They've uh, switched to lots of litter picking, um, particularly around Sarby Bridge, Mather and Road Brills and foot areas, which has been fantastic. Obviously, as we know, anything that is out on the ground is into the watercourse and, and blocking gullies and so forth and trash screens. So they've been doing a lot of that. And that's been really well received in the community. And it's been really nice actually to get out and do some face-to-face -face stuff. Um, at a distance, obviously, of a couple of metres between us all. Um, and some of those groups looking forward to do some face-to-face -face meetings uh, very soon, possibly outdoors rather than indoors, just due to numbers, really, and finding somewhere that can take us with, especially for the mind in my group that have got 29 members, it's um, quite difficult to social distance that amount of people in, in a small room. Um, I have a red rag... Um, action on my plan after we gathered updates. This remains a red rag um, action for quite a while. It's travel and transport um, and that's to improve communications with the public transport operators to enable and set upon additions to their services and to issue travel warning. That is an ongoing one um, and I'm hoping that in future meetings we can have somebody from um, the Coldwell team to discuss any opportunities there to make that um, better. Uh, slippage, um, as you're already aware, the S we're working on the S19 report. We understand that it's lots of different parties um, to complete that report and it has taken a, a really long time, but I'm hoping that's going to land with us really, really soon. And a uh, standing item of slippage that's been on my agenda for quite a long time is the public health recommendations from scrutiny, which I will keep pressing on. We allowed a small amount of um, breathing space due to um, COVID, but I have asked within my group that we press on with those updates. We haven't had an update on that for a really long time. Um, in terms of next steps for the next meeting, we're agenda setting um, next week, but we already have um, Ion Coldale in that agenda, so we're going to hear from um, the comms team on their um, updates with Ion Coldale. And I'm fortunate to be part of that team that's helping with that so I'm really looking forward to seeing some updates for that as we know that is a big resource for the, for the online community in terms of flooding for gathering their updates and that being um, streamlined and looking a lot better will be really welcome I think um, and unless I've missed anything I'll be looking at Neil and Joe um, just shout but I think that's about, about it from me thank you Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, just a quick question, Katie. Is the issue that you're having with the um, public transport providers the one whereby they stop services sometimes because of flooding and, and then downstream nobody knows that they've actually stopped the flooding? Yeah, it's communications yeah, out. So, yeah. For, yeah. Still, for example, right. on that, yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will see what I can do to intervene and help. Yeah, we understand that there's this. That it's not just the rail; it's the, the bus and how we collect that all together for people to see an overview of everything that's going on. Um, the example, you know, February 2020, people were going out to work on that Sunday and had absolutely no idea that there was anything wrong with the road because at some points you couldn't see that there was that there was flooding. But obviously, you know. There was flooding either side of, of there, so and they have no idea. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any any more comments? Um, not seeing anybody. Okay, thank you very much for, for that, Katie. Um, so item seven three communications. Uh, is this Lucy? Or 
It is, thank you. Um, just two quick points. Um, I'm delighted that we've uh, now fully replaced uh, Heather Pritchard um, in the role of campaigns officer supporting flooding. So we have in post Lauren Barber, who I think came to the last meeting, but we also have Janine Radcliffe. So they're working on a job share. Um, you should be able to see Lauren <laughs> waving on screen now. Um, so I'm delighted they've both um, joined us and they're settling in and um, full steam ahead in terms of the support we can provide um, in terms of comms. As Katie mentioned, the key thing that they're looking at currently is to update Iron Calderdale. We've um, finished the tender process and we're now sifting through all the submissions that we've had. Looks like we can, we'll, we've got some really good, strong submissions. So um, hopefully we can start making some really quick progress. Um, all the other details are in the report, but um, I or probably Lauren can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any any questions on the report for Lauren? Um, well, to whom welcome. Lauren, is there anything you want to, to add or comment on? No, that's everything. I just want to apologise for not having my camera on. We've got the yeah. children off, they're isolating, so I didn't want any little people in the background. Um, it's it's all it all it all adds to the liveliness of meetings. <laughs> we've 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 had a quiet meeting without uh, without any cats today as well, haven't we? Um, Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, so not seeing anybody else. So thank you, thank you, Lucy. Uh, okay, resilient infrastructure. I think this is, uh, is this you, Stephen or Neil? I was waiting for the cue from Stephen, but uh, hey, <laughs> shall I carry on? <laughs> he, he gave the cue, but he was yeah, muted. Okay, but, but, but go on, Neil. Seeing as I, seeing as I was muted, I, I, go on. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. Well, it might work the other way. I keep getting an unstable internet connection, so uh, I'll keep on video for now. But um, if you're struggling to hear me, just let me know, and I'll uh, I'll come off that. Uh, I'll only just flag up a few points from the uh, the report. Um, Interesting that uh, reference was made earlier to the Section 19 report from February 2020, uh, uh, 20, that um, the EA report will, will feed into that about the issues in uh, Mytham Road. So it's quite timely because we've just got our first draft through of that uh, report. We've been working with consultants uh, on that. So as a team, we're just reviewing that and then we'll be sharing that with our partners uh, for their comments on that before we uh, publish it. So having got it now, I'm thinking three months ahead to the next meeting, hopefully we can try and uh, bring that report through to the, through the next meeting uh, now. Um, good news around some of the telemetry that we've uh, installed. We've had telemetry, this is where we kind of look at uh, screens going into uh, culverts and uh, monitor them. So when we get, particularly when we get a, a weather event being forecast, uh, we're able to see without having to visit the site, what the uh, condition of those screens are and whether we need to get contractors out to clear them. So we've previously had it on a couple of screens, but we've now extended that to a further five schemes. So, you know, it really helps in terms of our resilience and, uh, and preparation, I think for any events uh, coming forward. Uh, positive news around um, investigations in, in the council where we've managed to get finally get, get a bit on top. It's taken a long time, really, almost since uh, February 2020, with just the number of um, inquiries uh, that we were getting through to start to, uh, to, to bring those numbers down. But thankfully, I think, you know, the team worked really hard in that uh, area and we have been blessed with some better weather recently. I'm always careful when I, when I say that. You never know what's, what's around the corner. But uh, things have been kind to us. So we've just about halved the numbers uh, most, more recently. Um, that's coming at a little bit of the expense of some of our asset uh, management. Uh, we're a bit down on numbers in the team at the moment currently. So we've, we've had to focus on the investigations, which I always see as being a priority because of those are the things that impact directly on the, uh, the people in the community who have been uh, flooded and impacted uh, by that. But in terms of asset management, um, we, we look to do a lot in terms of going out and inspecting the critical infrastructure in the borough. And we've talked about it many times, we've got old mill ponds, lots of third party owned critical assets that we do need to like to get around. So uh, some of that kind of takes a little bit of a backseat uh, when we've not got the resources in place at the time, but uh, hopefully uh, that will be overcome and we can get the team uh, fully up and running again and get back on track uh, with uh, those. 
And in terms of partner work, the Environment Agency, the recovery works again after the storm, Akira, that's, uh, that's sort of finally coming to an end. That includes the work at Shade Chapel, which I think many of you will, will be aware of now that the chapel's gone and the, the restoration work around the watercourse is, uh, is ongoing there. Um, a bit of a programme of work in there from uh, Network Rail as well, uh, which was uh, interesting. I always get a bit mixed up, Rick, between which is your side of the of the borough and which is the other. So uh, I'm not sure whether it's it's your part or not. But yeah, I right, finish at Whiteley there, Arches and go towards Rochdale. Right, I think it. Uh, yeah, so it might have been Matthew. It might be, yeah, it certainly came through from Matthew. So yeah, yeah so so that, that was the update from Matthew that we had, which I think sets out some of the works, which is both to reduce the potential for flooding on the uh, on the rail network, uh, but also that in turn can impact on properties uh, in the area. So, you know, really positive uh, work there. Um, I think that's probably all I want to say at this stage, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, any any questions for Neil on the, the infrastructure reports? No? Okay, not seeing anything, so all good. Thank you very much. So um, if that's okay, I'll move us on then to the Yorkshire Regional Flood and Coastal Committee update. I think that's got your name against it, Jane. Thank you. Um, I don't usually um, say much on this, but I have actually got some quick update items to offer. Um, the first thing is that the Regional Flooding and Coastal Committee also paid tribute to Dongria. Um, and the work that she's done over the last 30 years, particularly in the Upper Valley, but also wide, wider than that, really. And what a legacy she's left, really, for all of us in terms of not just tree planting, but thinking about natural, um, natural and community-based solutions to, to flooding problems. I, I drive past sometimes Colden Wood. I helped plant with a lot of children 30 years ago, and those trees are looking very fine and Dongri was instrumental in starting, starting that. Um, in terms of specific items, um, the committee has recently spent some time uh, talking about funding. The Environment Agency is just coming to the end of a six year programme of funding and is looking forward to what the next spending review is going to bring, whether it's going to be a one year settlement or a three year settlement again. And also beginning to discuss the question of the balance between capital for big engineering projects, uh, for more revenue, uh, pipeline of projects which would actually need more revenue um, in terms of natural based solutions. Uh, we've also been talking um, about a subject that I think is important in Calderdale and that's reservoirs. There are 70 plus reservoirs um, in Yorkshire as a whole. And those of you who know about these things, you know about the Reservoirs Act and so on, the legislation around reservoirs is fantastically complicated. And there's currently a consultation about uh, reservoir legislation. And I think we really do need, to, we need to be on, on top, of, top of those things. I know that Yorkshire Water and the Environment Agency are taking a fresh look at the question of reservoirs in Yorkshire. Um, We've also had more discussion uh, regionally, um, West Yorkshire and Yorkshire as a whole, about surface water modelling. As we begin to finish the larger en civil engineering projects um, to do with river overtopping, moving on to thinking about some of the surface water modelling, and you know up and across Calderdale actually that it's a real issue for some people, it isn't just the valley bottoms that get flooded. Um, we've also talked about construction costs and delays that are likely to projects in the near future. And this committee taking really, a, a, keeping a bit of an eye on some of the construction costs and um, the potential delays in terms of material, um, steel particularly, of course. And also because over the last six years, We've done a number of big projects, big engineering projects. And so we've had some of those, as it were, wins. And that the new projects, the pipeline of new projects over the next six years are likely to be natural flood solutions, community engagement projects, biodiversity projects. Um, we are going to be pushed towards more of these projects, I think. However, the point has to be made that all of these projects need capacity point that Paul made, community engagement doesn't just happen 
you do actually have to have capacity in the environment agency and the councils to have um, natural based solutions or community engagement. So there's money needed for those things. And the final one from me, Chair, is about the Yorkshire Summit. Um, ministers did not come good in terms of, of uh, coming to visit us and other Yorkshire areas um, which were flooded and the promised summit never materialised. Um, I understand that the, the chief uh, executives of the councils in Yorkshire, I think led by the chief executive in Doncaster, is planning a Yorkshire summit, uh, which will be the beginning of next year. And I think we as Calderdale and our partners will actually, I think, have a lot to contribute uh, to that Yorkshire summit in terms of good practice and, and, and lessons learned. Um, that's all. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. That's good. Uh, good, over, good overview and particularly issue about the funding. Are there um, any questions? Yes, Robin. Yeah. Just, just, just some assurance to Council Scully in that I, I represent West Yorkshire on that, the working group for that, um, led by Damien at Doncaster, uh, and um, it's very much reflecting the challenges we have in, in West Yorkshire. There's also significant interest from the mayor, uh, our new mayor in West Yorkshire, in that. So um, we're looking to align, potentially, rather than there being a kind of uh, more than one ask, we're looking to align her aspirations on a uh, focus on flooding with that. So um, it should be a real opportunity. And I think having there been a sort of disappointing, as you said, uh, sub-regional summit last year, I think we can do better and we're determined to. Thanks, thanks very much, Robin. And yeah, we'll, we'll continue to press and support that. Okay, any more on that? So we'll receive that. Thank you very much, Jane. And um, say we don't have any public questions under item nine question time um so we don't really have any other business so if uh oh katie yes <laughs> sorry i've always got any other business um the slow the flow are doing balsam bashing on uh sunday if anybody would like to join us we'd be delighted to see you i'm going to pop the link in there because due to COVID we have to limit numbers. We're about halfway at the minute to, to 25 people um, and yeah we'd love to see you there um, down at the crag. It's half past nine on Sunday morning um, and we'll be bashing Baltham um, for the foreseeable just uh, due to um, well, we can't carry logs and things and be in close proximity for now. We'd love to be doing leaf jams but um, we, we just can't at the moment. So next best thing for us all to get together is to do balsam bashing, which fits in with um, uh, all partners on the invasive species um, plan that we've got going on at the moment. So thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Yeah, we can share that link. That's, that's great. Okay, any more? Jane? Yeah, I've just put a note in the chat to say oh. that we would be remiss of us yes, not to acknowledge absolutely. the um, fantastic achievement of Slow the Flow in getting the, the, the mm. Queen, Queen's Award for Voluntary Activity. What a fantastic achievement, very well deserved. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You, Jay. Absolutely. <laughs> if we can if we can minute that, Kirsty, that'd be pretty, that'd be great as well. Thank you. Um, any more? <laughs> it's, it's a day for AOBs, isn't it? I think I started by saying we don't have AOB, but never mind. Stephen yeah, the, and Joe. Yeah, this is this is just an incredibly quick one. Um, just to let the uh, the board know that we're advertising for a new um, flood project engineer at the moment, uh, so that that advert's live. Thanks, Stephen and Joe. Did I see you? Um... All right. Okay. No. Right. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. I think that concludes the meeting. So thank you. I'll declare it closed.